Chapter 85 Ellen woke up, and the bedroom was still dark. She was lying on top of the comforter in her clothes, and Marcella was spooning her, fully clothed, his arm hooked over her waist. The bedside clock glowed 3.46 a.m., and she waited for sleep to return. But it was as if a switch had been thrown in her brain. A light seared through the dark room of her and her relationship to Will, and she found herself coming full circle again, so she began. Last week, I was asked to write a story about what it feels like to lose a child. We were concerned that, among all of the statistics and bar graphs attending an article about the city's escalating homicide rate, the value of a child's life would be lost. So, I set out to interview women who had lost children. I spoke with Letitia Williams, whose eight-year-old son, Latif, was killed by stray bullets, a victim of violence between two gangs. I also spoke with Susan Suleiman, a Bryn Mawr mother, whose two children were abducted by their father several years ago. And now, to their examples, I can add my own. As you may know, I lost my son this week when I learned that, unbeknownst to me, my adoption of him was illegal. My son is, in fact, a child by the name of Timothy Braverman, who was kidnapped from a Florida couple two years ago. I hope you don't think I'm being presumptuous in inserting my Ellen Pulder coat closer around her. Looks like national, too, and TV. Marcello craned his neck, slowing the car as they neared the house. I'll let you read Sal's piece before we file. You filing this afternoon, by two? He can wait. I'll email it to you. Thanks. Ellen knew he was pushing the deadline for her. Are you coming in? If you would like, I'm happy to meet Connie. Come in and meet her. Then I think I'll be okay. They approached the house, and to Ellen's surprise, her neighbor, Mrs. Knox, was out front, ignoring the reporters and shoveling her walk for her. The sight gave her a sudden pang of guilt and gratitude. Maybe she wasn't such a busybody after all. Here we go. Marcello pulled up, double parked, and hit the emergency lights. We'll have to do this fast. Okay. Ellen grabbed her purse, and they both opened the doors and jumped out. She hustled around the front of the car, almost slipping on the snow, and Marcello took her arm, and they hurried together, arms raised protectively, then chased that thought away. Across the room near the back door lay another island of blood, smaller but just as nauseating, where more must have fallen. The stink of gasoline hung in the air, and a dozen yellow spots stained the floor where the solvent had splattered. She squeezed her eyes shut against an instant replay of Will's mouth taped shut, his snowsuit drenched with gasoline. I told you it was bad. It's worse than bad. Ellen bit her lip, thinking, Do you think I can scrub the blood out? No, and I swear, I smell it. There's only one solution. Cover it with a rug? No. Ellen crossed to the window and opened it, then fumbled around for the metal slides and threw open the storm windows, letting in a blast of fresh, snowy air that somehow felt cleansing. I'm going to rip up the whole damn floor. You mean do it yourself? Connie smiled, surprised. Sure. How hard can it be? It's just destruction. Any idiot can destroy something. Ellen went to the base cabinet, found her orange plastic toolbox, and set it out on top of the stove, trying not to notice that one burner was missing. She opened the toolbox and took out her hammer. I'm no contractor, but the sharp end looks like it could do the trick. If I start now, I can get it done by tonight. You want to do it now? Why not? One way or the other, this floor is getting thrown away. I don't want it in my house another minute. Ellen took a gulp of fresh air, wielded the hammer, and bent down over one of the gasoline stains. She raised the hammer high over her head and brought its sharp end down with all her might. Crack! The edge of the hammer splintered the wood, but unfortunately embedded itself there. Oops. Ellen yanked on the handle of the hammer, and its head came free, splintering the wood. Looks like it works, but at this rate, I'll be finished by next year. I have a better idea. Connie stepped around her, opened the door to the basement, and went downstairs, and by the time she returned, eat. After Connie had gone home, Ellen piled the last of the broken floorboards on her back porch, because reporters were still camped out front. She stepped back inside the kitchen, shut the door against the cold, 
and closed the window, breathing in deeply. The gasoline smell was gone, but the subfloor was a mess. Removing the top boards had only exposed the older floor beneath, and she hadn't been able to pull out all the nails. They popped up here and there, making an obstacle course for Oreo Figaro, who walked gingerly to his food dish. Ellen crossed to the refrigerator, careful not to step on a nail or a cat, and opened the door. She was about to reach for a bottle of water when her hand stopped in midair. Staring her in the face was the Pyrex bowl of lime green jello, with a shiny cavern dug in the middle. It's good, Mommy. She grabbed the water bottle and slammed the door closed, determined to get through the rest of the day. The house had fallen quiet, a hollow echo of how she felt. She checked the clock on the wall, 2.25. Odd that Marcello hadn't called, and she had yet to call her father. She left the room with the water, twisted off the cap, and took a slug, then went into the living room, hearing only the sound of her footsteps on the floor. She found her purse and dug inside for her blackberry, but it wasn't there. She must have dropped it in Marcello's car. She looked up, aggravated, and through the windows she could see a commotion on the sidewalk. Reporters and photographers clustered around a taxi pulling up in front of the house, and in the next second, emerging from the crowd, was her father. Dad? Ellen ran to the door as he waved off the press, taking the arm of an attractive woman in a chic white wool coat, probably his new wife, whose name Ellen had almost forgotten. Honey, what the hell? Her father asked, stepping inside, his hazel eyes round with disbelief. He stamped snow from his loafers. This is crazy. I know, it's awful. Ellen introduced herself and extended her hand to his wife. Barbara, right? Hello, Ellen. Me. I have a lawyer, Dad. He says what they're doing is legal. Then you didn't get yourself a good enough mouthpiece. Her father jabbed his finger toward her chest, but Barbara put her hand on his jacket sleeve. Don, don't yell at her. We talked about this. You know what she's been through. But they can't take him away. Her father threw up his hands, his expression caught between bewilderment and pain. I go away for one minute, and when I come home, my grandson is gone? How can this be legal? Dad, relax. Ellen stepped forward. Sit down, have a cup of coffee, and I'll tell you the story. You'll understand the situation better. I understand the situation just fine. Her father whirled around, his finger pointing again. I remember when you came to see me. You thought the kid in the picture was Will. So I got it wrong. You happy now? What? Ellen asked, stricken. Don? Barbara shouted so loudly that he stood stunned for a moment. Shut up right now. She faced him head on, despite her tiny frame. I can't believe what I'm seeing. I can't believe this is the man I just married. I know you're a better man than this. What? Her father said, but accusation had left his tone. This isn't about you, or even Will. Barbara raised a manicured hand. This is about your daughter, your only daughter. Start focusing on the child you have instead of the one you don't. But she shouldn't have said anything. She should have just shut up. Ellen felt slapped, and Barbara's mouth dropped open. Dawn, she did what any good mother would do. She did what was right for her child, even though it cost her. Ellen recovered, listening. Barbara had given the clearest and best statement of why she'd followed up on that damn white card. She'd never thought of it exactly that way. Her father's gaze shifted from Barbara to Ellen, suddenly very sad. He raked his thin hair with trembling fingers. I'm sorry, Elle. I didn't mean it. I know, Dad. It's just that Will was my chance. What do you mean? Ellen asked, mystified, and tears came to her father's eyes. The only other time she'd seen him cry was at her mother's funeral, and the sight caught her by the throat. He was my chance, Elle my second chance. Ellen touched his arm, sensing what he'd say before he said it. She gave him a big hug, and he eased into her arms with a little moan. Everything I did wrong with you, I was going to do right with him. I wanted to make it up to you, to your mother. Ellen thought her heart would break, and in the next minute, her eyes brimmed with tears, and she found herself crying like a baby in her father's arms. I'm so sorry, honey, he whispered, 
as Ellen sobbed and breathed in his expensive aftershave, and she drew real comfort from his embrace in a way she never had before. The deepest pain in her heart eased just a little, and she let herself feel how very powerful is something so simple, yet so profound. Let me in. We're on TV, girlfriend. You have no right to come here. Sarah tried to shut the front door, but Ellen straight-armed it open. Thanks, don't mind if I do. She powered over the threshold into a warm, well-appointed living room, furnished with gray suede sectionals and a thick pile matching rug where two young boys were sitting on the floor playing a noisy video game on a widescreen TV. Wait, my kids are here. I can see that. Ellen masked her emotions to wave to them. Hey guys, how you doing? Fine, one answered without looking up. But Sarah shut the door and motioned to them. Boys, go to your room, she said, staccato and they set down the game controllers and rose instantly, astounding Ellen. She couldn't get that kind of obedience from her hair, much less her son. They left the room, and Sarah picked up the controller, hit the red button for off, and set it down on top of the TV, which had gone black. Sarah, how could you do it? Ellen kept her temper in check. Not just to me, but to Will. How could you do that to Will? I oral to spy on me? To search my computer? You even tricked my son into telling you where I was. He wasn't your son, he was their son. He was my son. Not legally. He was my son, until I said different. Ellen felt angry tears, and at some level, even she knew she was yelling at the wrong person. She wasn't angry at Sarah, she was angry at everyone and everything. Angry that it had happened in the first place. So she couldn't stop herself. I would never do anything to hurt your children, no matter what. You're not worried about Will. You're worried about yourself. You know what? You're right. I love my son, and I want him home, and I'm never going to have him again. But most of all, I want him to be happy. If he's happy, I'm happy. And thanks to you, he's in pain. And there was a noise behind them from the other end of the living room, and Ellen turned around, shocked at the sight. It was Myron Crims, Sarah's husband, but he was in a wheelchair. She had met him only once, a fissure in Sarah's forehead, and wondered why she'd never noticed it before. All this time, she thought she was the only one on a single income, but she'd been wrong. I was doing what was right for my family. Sarah's voice remained controlled and her gaze unwavering. I was doing what I had to do. You could have told me. Ellen felt disarmed, grasping. You could have warned me. What would you have said? Don't take the money? Sarah snorted. It was my family or your family. I chose my family. You would have done the same. I don't know, Ellen answered after a minute. She was thinking back to what the cop had said at the ER waiting room. It's no win. Suddenly she didn't know anymore what was right or moral, what was legal or fair. She no longer took satisfaction in confronting Sarah. She wasn't composed enough to analyze the situation. She couldn't even tell what she would have done in Sarah's position. She knew only that Will was gone, and there was a deep rent in her chest where her heart had... She clopped slowly up the stairs, the sound of her clogs like the ticking of a clock slowing down. She had never felt like this in her life. She was empty, a ghost of a person. She went into her office on autopilot, flicked on a light, and crossed to the computer. She sat down and moved the mouse and her computer monitor woke up with a screensaver of Will, posing with Oreo Figaro. Please, no. She opened up Outlook and watched the bold-faced names pile into the inbox. She waited for Marcello's email to load and braced herself to read the article. But Marcello's wasn't the email that caught her eye. She moved the mouse, clicked on another email, and opened it, reading quickly. And then she screamed. And when she stopped screaming... She reached for the phone. Chapter 92 Ellen shot up like a rocket, sending her desk chair rolling back across the floor and ran to the door, then tore down the stairs. Clop, 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 like a racehorse, passing the thick gold seal of the FBI, the framed picture of the president and the attorney general, the ten most wanted posters, and whatever else was hanging on the off-white walls. She followed Special Agent Orr down the glistening hallway and reached a wooden door with a plaque that read Conference Room. Special Agent Orr twisted the knob. 
Here you go, Miss Gleason, he said, admitting her, then leaving. Ellen stepped inside, getting her bearings. She had driven the farthest to get here, so they were all already in place. Special Agent Manning stood up at the head of the table, and on the near side, Ron Halpern stood up too, with an uncertain smile. He was dressed in a tux from a benefit dinner, and Ellen shook his hand. Sorry to disrupt your night, gentlemen, she said, sitting down next to Ron. She nodded at Special Agent Manning, who retook his seat at the head of the table. Thank you, too, Special Agent. It's my job. His smile was only polite, and he was dressed casually with a blue FBI windbreaker over a light Oxford shirt. Behind him was a large smoked glass window that overlooked the snowy city. Um. Will took off after his friend Brett, and Ellen's father came over, his eyes glittering with mischief. I'll take that weapon, my lady. What for? Ellen handed it over. Just writing stories about women. Everyone notices that your books are set in Philadelphia. Tell me what you love about Philadelphia. Well, I, I always want to keep it real. That's really my touchstone. And I've lived in Philadelphia all my life. I've never really, if there weren't a book tour, I would never, like, go anywhere. Although that's sad. I mean, I would like to, but I think I'm very rooted here. And it enables me to write about characters who have a different relationship to their roots. Um, I think Philadelphia is a backdrop, but the books I don't think are about Philadelphia. I think because I find what happens in Happily at this point, I get lots of email from readers, which I answer. And if you write about something with specificity, whatever it is, the minutiae of your day or a city, then what happens is people extrapolate that specific to the general. And they go, that's just like the flats in Cleveland. That's just like this area of Boston. You know, there are parts of London like that and parts of Amsterdam, too. And that doesn't happen if you if you write generally it just looks like a street with palm trees, kind of like some TV shows have that. You don't even know where it's set. And that's problematic because you tell, would you not tell? That in- necessarily invokes the question of who owns that child. And you get a different answer depending on who you are. Well, thank you very much for talking with me. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed Look Again, a Macmillan audiobook published by St. Martin's Press. Look Again was produced by Paul Rubin, executive producer Laura Wilson, and read by Mary Stuart Masterson. Text copyright 2009 by Lisa Scottolini. Production copyright 2009, Macmillan Audio. All rights reserved. <laughs>